Well, good morning. morning. Reading from Hebrews 1, 1 to 3. Long ago at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. That, of course, is speaking of our glorious Savior, Jesus Christ. It is his name that we raise this morning as a banner over us. And his banner over us, as a reminder, is love. And so would we please uh, open in prayer? And you can join in faith with my prayers as we open our worship service today. Or what a privilege it is to know that uh, we have, yes, the opportunity to gather, but also the opportunity to sing and pray and read and preach and hear your word this day. You have indeed spoken to us through your son, the word made flesh. You do speak to us, of course, through your word, and we thank you that you will honor your word today. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Our reading this morning we'll find in John chapter 1. I'll give you a moment to find that. John chapter 1, we're reading verses 35 to 51. This should be over my right shoulder, and it is indeed. I think I'm actually going to read the bigger print this morning, if that's okay. <laughs> the next day again, John the Baptist was standing with two of his disciples, and he looked at Jesus as he walked by and said, Behold, the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. Jesus turned and saw them following and said to them, What are you seeking? And they said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? He said to them, Come and you will see. So they came and saw where he was staying, and they stayed with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. One of the two who heard John speak and followed Jesus was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which means Christ. He brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, So you are Simon, the son of John? You shall be called Cephas, which means Peter. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathanael said to him, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming towards him and said of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael said to him, How do you know me? Jesus answered him, Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathanael answered him, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus answered him, Because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Let's uh, pray as we continue our service. Um, Lord, we thank you for your word this morning. Again, as we opened we are mindful that there are so many voices in the land so many voices that speak to us every day the images that bombard us the the messages that tell us uh, what to value how to behave um, what to hope for that all compete uh, with your voice 
but we're thankful that as your sheep, you promise that we will hear your voice. And we pray that our hearts would incline themselves uh, unto you and unto that voice, even this day. We come to you as needy people. We come to you as people that in thought and word and deed fall far short of you. And we, we need that throne of grace this morning, that grace uh, from which and through which and in which we find grace and mercy to help in time of need. And that tells me this morning that your mercies are varied and they're deep. They're able to meet every need this morning, whether great or small, whether emotional or physical or spiritual. We thank you that you are the God that wants to meet your people and to meet needs in so doing. And so we come to you. We come to you uh, with thankful hearts. We come to you that uh, thankful that you have indeed forgiven our sins, that your gospel, this glorious gospel, is something that we can live by day by day by day, hopefully ringing not only in our ears but in our hearts, that we, your righteous, live by faith. Faith in the Son of God who loved us and gave himself for us. We're thankful that we no longer look to ourselves. We no longer look to our own performance to know, are we right with you? We know that we are right as we gaze into uh, your word and, and understand uh, what you have done for us, that there is indeed now no condemnation in Christ. And for those in our family this morning that can't be with us, we, we pray the richest of blessings to them, that they would know of your goodness this morning, the kinds of goodness that we've sung about already, the kinds of wonders that we've sung about. May they know in their hearts that they are loved, but also missed. And we pray for the recovery. Um, for others that are away, I think of uh, Mike and, and Stephen and, and the ministry that goes out from our place on a, on a weekly basis, really. Uh, we thank you that your word does go forth and we pray for uh, sustaining grace for them as well, that uh, your word would uh, be um, spoken with confidence and clarity this morning, uh, and we thank you for that. We pray for this world as well and the challenges that we continue to, to find that weigh upon our hearts. Um, Lord, we, it's beyond us, and we've been praying consistently a simple but profound prayer. Um, Lord, may your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Thank you that you've given us that as an example. You've given us that as, in a way, a perfect prayer. And it's something that we can pray, even when we know not how we ought to pray. Thank you for the promises, even of Romans 8, which tells us that when we pray, led by your spirit, we do pray your will. And so help us to be in the spirit as we pray, praying confidently and boldly for the peace of Jerusalem praying for the Prince of Peace to have greater sway over the hearts and minds of our brothers, our sisters, of our communities, our nations, our leaders all around the world. And we pray this this morning in Christ's name. Uh, amen. Well, good morning, everybody, and uh, my welcome to and our thanks, of course, to Gary for leading our service. You may like to have open before you the passage we read earlier, which is from the first chapter of John's Gospel. And our theme this morning is the blessings of evangelism, and I suppose uh, it's pretty obvious what they are, because if there were no blessings of evangelism, none of us would be here. We owe the fact that God, by his grace, has brought a message of salvation to this world and has proclaimed that message through generations of Christian people. And even as I'm speaking, perhaps you're thinking of those who were responsible under God for bringing you to faith, for whom uh, you give thanks to God, who proclaimed the gospel to you, who taught you in your early Christian life, 
who continue to be a challenge and an inspiration to you. Certainly it's an encouragement, isn't it, to hear how people come to faith in Christ, to learn the testimony of those who are now his loyal followers. And so maybe it's a good idea for us this morning to look at the way in which five men, and they all were men as it happened, came to their faith in Christ. And that's the story that we read in the passage, uh, John chapter 1, verses 35 to 51. Five men who were Jesus' first disciples. They lived and worked in the same area on the northern shore of the Sea of Galilee, but as becomes increasingly clear throughout the gospel records, they were very different in temperament and type. But in addition to their Galilean roots, they had this in common, their love for Jesus and their desire to follow him. We, we know four of these men by name. If you see through the scriptures, you read of Andrew in verse 40 and Simon, verse 42. Hailing from Bethsaida, they were now living six miles away in Capernaum and working as fishermen in partnership with another couple of brothers, James and John, the sons of Zebedee. Next, there was Philip, who we read, verse 44, also came from Bethsaida, and a man, presumably Philip's close friend, who was called Nathaniel. In the three other Gospels, when the list is made of the people who Jesus chose to be his apostles, we find that Philip is mentioned alongside someone called Bartholomew. So it might be, well be the case that these two men, Nathaniel and Bartholomew, were one and the same, that these were two different names, just as we know Simon as Simon sometimes and Peter at other times. There's also one unnamed man in this little passage. Did you notice that? That there were two followers of John the Baptist who came to faith in Christ, one of whom we were uh, reading about earlier, but one who is unnamed. And commentators have no doubt that this was John, the fisherman business partner of Andrew and Simon, who much later was to be the author of the fourth gospel, the letters in the New Testament that bear his name, and the final book in the New Testament canon, the book of Revelation. So five men, and they all came to Jesus. But how did that happen? How did they learn of the gospel? And how did they respond to it? Well, let me suggest, first of all, that John and Andrew were brought to Jesus by the preaching of the gospel. You see that in John chapter 1, verses 35 to 37. We read that the next day, John was standing with two of his disciples, and he looked at Jesus as he walked by and said, Behold, the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. The ministry of John the Baptist, which is recorded in all of the Gospels, was truly remarkable. It was conducted in the wilderness of Judea, and it was an uncompromising call for repentance, not, you would think, a popular message at all. And yet it attracted crowds of people. We read from Jerusalem and Judea and all the region about the Jordan. Mark goes even so far as to say that all the country of Judea and Jerusalem were going out to him. And having found John, the crowds not only listened to him, but we read, they were baptized by him, confessing their sins. Secular historians might suggest that John's preaching found a kind of chord in the nation's psyche, but we know better. In accordance with scriptures, in fulfillment of prophecy and by the power of God, John the Baptist was preparing the way for the Lord Jesus. John was both a prophet and the subject of prophecy, and Jesus describes him later as more than a prophet. His ministry was truly prophetic. And so that raises the question, well, what was his message? And I think we can sum it up in three simple phrases. First of all, his message showed men their need of Christ. Both Mark and Luke note that John was preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins, and that's surely where the gospel message starts. Not with the proclamation of the love of God, but with the proclamation of the wrath of God. Not with the fact that we can come close to God, 
but with the fact that we are distant from God. Not with a declaration of the possibility of faith, but with a declaration of the need for forgiveness. You will have heard the story, no doubt apocryphal, of the man on holiday in Ireland who asked a local how to get to the railway station. If I wanted to get there, he was told, I wouldn't start from here. Well, that same sort of logic seems to obtain in many churches. They don't want to start here with an acknowledgement of the existence and the seriousness of sin. They don't want to preach about that because it's not a popular message. It's not an attractive talk to give. It's too uncompromising. And yet, that's exactly what John the Baptist did, and that is what we are called to do as well. It's ever the mark of biblical preaching, first to make clear that by nature, we are children of wrath. That is, deserving of the wrath of God, for the Apostle Paul writes, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. This may not be a message that people want to hear, but it's certainly a message that they need to hear. And it's a message that we should not be ashamed to proclaim. And that's why Jesus later said, I came not to call the righteous, that is those who consider themselves right before God, but sinners. It is only those who recognize that they are sinners and then who understand in part at least the seriousness of sin, who will be interested in and drawn to the work of Christ. So our preaching must be clear and unequivocal on this point, that men have need of Christ. So if that's the first strand of, G, of, of John's teaching, here's the second. His message pointed men to the person of Christ. Did you notice that in the reading? John drew huge crowds from a wide area, but he never drew attention to himself. At one stage, Luke says, all were questioning in their hearts concerning John, whether he might be the Christ. But he was quick to deny it. And he did so emphatically. We didn't read the little section earlier on, but in this chapter, John chapter one, but uh, if we did, we would read these words. John chapter one and verse 19. The Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who are you? He confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, what then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. He said, they, they said, are you the prophet? And he answered, no. So they said to him, who are you? We need to give an answer to those who sent us. Who, what do you say about yourself? He said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord. He was one who was pointing always to Jesus. The unvarying focus of the ministry of John the Baptist was the one whose sandals he was not worthy to stoop down and untie, the one who was more powerful than he was, the one who would baptize not with water, but with the Holy Spirit. Later, John was delighted to hear the ministry of Jesus, declared that his joy was complete and made the statement that should be at the head of every page of every sermon we ever preach. He must increase, but I must decrease. <coughs> Above everything else, John wanted men to look to Jesus, for he was the Lord who had come in fulfillment of prophecy. He was the one on whom the Spirit of God had fallen on his baptism. He was truly the Son of God. And so, not surprisingly, this is always a, a hallmark of biblical preaching, not to dazzle people with clever words, but to, to direct people to the living word, not to draw attention to ourselves so that people will think a lot about us, but to direct people to our saviour so that they will think a lot about him. Not so much to interest people in ideas as to introduce them to a person. That's the biblical pattern. And that's exactly what John did. And that's what Paul said he did too. <clears throat> he said, I, to the Corinthians, I, when I came to you, brothers, did not come proclaiming to you 
the testimony of God with lofty words or wisdom, I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And later in his second letter, <clears throat> Paul said, what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord. It is his reputation that counts, not ours. Our task is to point men to Christ. So John's ministry had this about it. His message showed men their need of Christ. His message pointed men to the person of Christ. And thirdly, his message explained to men the cross of Christ. This is a vital part of the presentation of the gospel. Yes, we explain to people the seriousness of sin. Yes, we give them a sight of the Son of God, but we leave them somewhat bereft of hope, unless also we describe to them the suffering of the Saviour. That's precisely the point that John was making when he said more than once, behold, the Lamb of God. Now you might think that was a very strange thing to say, but it would not have been in the least bit strange to those first century hearers. They were Jewish men and women, very familiar with all the paraphernalia, as we might call it, of sacrificial offerings, and not least during the annual celebration of the Passover, the sacrifice of a lamb. They knew that somehow God would pass over their sins if a lamb were sacrificed. That ancient act of sacrifice, which led promptly to the delivery of God's people from their slavery in Egypt, was only a picture, a picture of what would happen centuries later and was about to unfold in the days of John the Baptist, when Jesus came willingly to the world to be its saviour. As Peter was later to explain to persecuted Christians scattered around the Middle East, he said this, 1 Peter chapter 1, you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. Paul said to Timothy that we know that Jesus came into the world to save sinners. So John was absolutely right when he said, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John was, Jesus was very much alive when John said this. Indeed, he was not yet properly to start his earthly ministry. But John had prophetic insight to know that he who was alive had come to die not as an old man, but as a young man. Not by accident, but by design. Not for his own sin, for he had none, but for the sin of the world. On the cross of Calvary, Jesus paid the price for your sin and for mine, and for all those who turn in repentance and faith to him. The old chorus puts it rather well. There's a way back to God from the dark paths of sin, there's a door that is open and you may go in. At Calvary's cross is where you begin when you come as a sinner to Jesus. It's right in evangelical circles such as ours that we stress the importance therefore of preaching. These two first disciples we've looked at came to Christ by that means. Preaching is not a human idea, but one of the means appointed by God by which the gospel which focuses on the good news about Jesus is publicly proclaimed. That was certainly the teaching of the Apostle Paul. In Romans he says, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? Now, I know that there are those who argue that the day of preaching is over, since we have other and better means now of communicating with people and of proclaiming the gospel. Certainly, we thank God for all the benefits of modern technology. Some of you are struggling with your hearing, and you're grateful 
that we've got an audio loop in place and some microphones to assist. But we cannot with impunity ignore God, part of God's written word and the argument of the Apostle Paul. Rather, we should rejoice that we have a great message to proclaim and the great responsibility of doing so. As the aged Paul by that stage said to his young Lieutenant Timothy, I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom, my, this is making it a very solemn pledge, isn't it? Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Re reprove, rebuke, and correct with complete patience and teaching. And so these first two disciples, we discover, came to Jesus, John and Andrew, by the preaching of the gospel. What a blessing it is that we have the freedom to preach the gospel and that we have a gospel to preach and that we have an indwelling Holy Spirit to guide and direct us and that we are assured that the word of God will not fall foul as it is proclaimed. So that was the first two. The second two we read about were Simon and Nathaniel. They weren't brought to Jesus by the preaching of the gospel so much as by the personal work of Christians. Did you notice that? John chapter 1, verses 40 to 42. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. Sorry, I'm reading the wrong place. Um, one of the two who heard John speak, that's John the Baptist, and followed Jesus was Andrew, Simon's Peter, Peter's brother. He first found his own brother Simon and said to him, we have found the Messiah, which means Christ. He brought him to Jesus. How wonderful. How wonderful. The work of simple communication, one to the other, personal work, work done by one to the other. And we see the same later with Nathaniel. We'll come to that in a moment. I want you to notice three things about this work of bringing people to Jesus, this privilege that we have of evangelism and the blessing that it is. First of all, note that it was personal. We read that the first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon. And similarly later we read, Philip found Nathaniel. I like that word find there. They went to find these men. They didn't wait for some opportunity that might have arisen at a later stage, today, tomorrow, next week, next month, next year. They went deliberately to find these people. No, no chance meetings here. Andrew and Philip both had particular people in mind. They themselves had heard the gospel and they were keen to pass it on to others. The work was personal. A man telling his brother, another man telling his friend. I wonder how often that is the case. People are still brought to the Lord by the personal work and the personal testimony of people they know who have become Christians, not preachers, not those standing up in pulpits, not those writing learned books, but those who simply tell the gospel to a friend, a neighbor, a relative, a colleague, someone that they're in touch with. Maybe here this morning, there are many of us who remember somebody who did that exact thing for us, a little personal word inviting us to a meeting, talking to us about the faith, explaining to us about their commitment to Jesus. And that was a link in a chain that led ultimately to the Lord Jesus. I remember reading an article about some student work and an overseas student who had come to this country, not thinking for a moment about the Christian faith, um, spoke about what had happened in the early days at university here and said that um, some Christians in their hall of residence had built a bridge of friendship to me. And over that bridge walked Jesus, the personal work. People are still brought by that way. There are thousands, surely. 
Secondly, notice that it was positive. The testimony that both Andrew and Philip brought here was very positive. They were joyful. They were excited about what they discovered. We have found the Messiah. We have found the one Moses wrote about. How exciting, how wonderful. Isn't this glorious? How enthusiastic they were. They simply couldn't stop themselves talking about what they had discovered. It seemed the most natural thing in the world to do. Oh, that more of our personal work were like that. How often we seem apologetic, even almost embarrassed, ashamed, when we share the gospel. If it's the good news that we declare it to be, then why are we not more enthusiastic? Why cannot we proclaim it joyfully? The gospel is a saving message to a world heading for hell, but we shall never spread it effectively if we don't see it as a positive joy in our own lives. That's what it ought to be. And that's what it was for these two men, Simon and Nathaniel, as they spread the gospel to their friend, to their brother. It was personal work. It was positive work. And then I like the fact that it was practical work. Did you notice that? Neither Andrew nor Philip were content merely with talking about Jesus, telling something about him to their brother and friend. But we read, verse 42, that Andrew brought Simon to Jesus and that Philip said to Nathaniel, come and see. Both men backed up their personal testimony by taking Simon and Nathaniel to see Jesus personally. They brought these men to Jesus. They did not merely send them. Their work was practical. Now, of course, we can't take people to meet Jesus physically in the way that these men did. But we can take them, bring them, direct them, and be with them to a place where they will learn more. Like this church, for example. We could bring people here. We could say, well, come and see. Come with me. I'll go with you to that place where we can learn, to that Bible study, to that church, to that meeting where we'll learn more about Jesus. Personal witness should always have this practical dimension to it. Don't be ashamed or afraid to bring your non-Christian friends to church, to the meetings that we run on Sundays, to the meetings that we run midweek as well. So we learn much from the example of Andrew and Philip. They brought Simon and Nathaniel to Jesus by work that was personal, that was positive, that was practical. Um, but there's more here too that we ought just to say in passing. You may be thinking, well, it's all right for them, but I'm really quite scared of what people might say to me or what people might ask of me. And we've got both of these here. Did you notice that? Nathaniel wanted to know if anything good could come out of Nazareth, verse 44. Did you notice that little phrase? He'd been introduced, he'd been told about Jesus of Nazareth. And he said rather disdainfully, can anything good come out of Nazareth, that tiny little place of no consequence? Surely not. It was a rather disdainful remark. And there are people who are still saying that sort of thing. Come to the church. Huh. Why would I come to the church? Whatever good has come out of the church, whatever good has come out of reading the Bible, whatever come, good has come out of worshipping God, so what do we do? We say nothing in case they say that. No, we do what Philip did and press upon those people the claims of Christ and then trust God to bless his word in his time to his glory. And what about questions that people might ask us? What do we say about that? Well, we've got the example here. Again, haven't we? Just like Nathaniel, people might have questions. What good can come out of Nazareth? Now, how do I answer that? What do I say? What's the best answer? What ought I to say? Maybe I'm going to say the wrong thing. 
Oh dear, I'm in a bit of a pickle over this. Actually, Philip didn't try to answer the question at all. And unless you know good, positive, biblical answers, you need to be prepared to say, I don't know. I don't quite know how to answer that question. But come and see. I can take you somewhere where we can get the answer. I can introduce you to someone who will know how to address that issue. Come and see. I may not have all the answers, but I know someone who does. And that is the privilege of evangelism. So these two men, Philip and Nathaniel, were brought to Christ by just simple personal work of Christians. Two then were brought by the preaching of the gospel. Two were brought by the personal work of Christians. But there was this third man, this unnamed man, whom we believe to have been the uh, Apostle John, as he became, the one who, in fact, wrote this gospel and always was seeking to be quiet about it. He wasn't uh, saying anything much about it. Um, well, <coughs> let's have a look. Number three, we're going to focus actually on Philip. Don't know much about Philip, do we? His name appears here, but we really don't know much about him. But Jesus did. Verse 43, the next day Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, follow me. So just as Andrew went to find his brother Simon, and Philip later found Nathanael, Jesus went to find Philip. Philip was sought by Jesus. There was no human agency so far as we can tell. What a glorious truth this is. And this lies really at the heart of all evangelism, the realization that the success in evangelism ultimately depends upon the work of God. And here we have Jesus going to find Philip by the power of Christ alone. Two men brought by the preaching of the gospel, two men brought by the personal work of Christians, this man brought by the power of Christ alone. Three things. First, Jesus knew about Philip. He found Philip and said, follow me. Now, Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. And clearly, Jesus knew about this man. He knew who he was. He knew where he lived. He knew his background. In fact, of course, although this was the first time we read about Philip, and all we know about him is that he came from Bethsaida, Jesus knew all about him. He knew all about him. He's mentioned specifically by name, in just the same way that later the Lord calls Zacchaeus to come down from the tree. And later still, he calls Saul on the road to Damascus. All that the Lord does for us and to us and through us and in us has this as its basis, that he knows us thoroughly. How wonderful that is. Secondly, Jesus went to find Philip. He decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip. Here's a lovely illustration of the principle that Jesus announced. Um, we find it in Luke chapter 19, verse 10. He said, the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost. It sometimes looks as if we're seeking him, that we're doing the running, as it were, that we have to, to, to do all the effort, that it all depends on us. But actually, that's only because he first sought us and he is beginning to move in our hearts and minds by the power of the Holy Spirit. As John says in his first letter, he, we love him because he first loved us. And here's a wonderful example that as they go about their journeys, so Jesus goes to find this man, Philip. Just the same way we have been brought to faith because the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost. Jesus 
went to find Philip. Jesus knew about Philip. And of course, Jesus wanted Philip. He said, follow me. Jesus had a role for Philip in his kingdom. This man who we know very little about. This man who, who is hidden, rather silent, as the gospel records proceed. He was no doubt there during those years of Jesus' earthly ministry, taking his part with the others in the work that Jesus gave them to do. We don't find him mentioned by name frequently. We know little about him. But clearly, Jesus had a purpose for him, a part for him to play, and therefore called him into his kingdom. It was Jesus who took the initiative. It was Christ who said, follow me. And whether we recognize it or not, that's always the case, that it is Jesus who's seeking, Jesus who's saving. The children of God are those who have been chosen by God, and the initiative is his. The Lord knows us by name, and he brings us to salvation. So, praise God for that. So where have we got to? John and Andrew were brought to Jesus by the preaching of the gospel. And we say that in the work of evangelism, that still remains a very important part of the blessings that God has given us, the privilege of proclaiming his word. Simon and Nathaniel were brought to Jesus by the personal work of Christians, personal work, positive work, practical work, and work that we can all be engaged in. It is a privilege for all of us, and therefore a great blessing for us to be engaged in that. Philip was brought to Jesus by the power of Christ alone. And that reminds us that he is the great God who has purposes, plans for those that he calls to himself. And even some of the greatest evangelists have recognized this. So listen to the Apostle Paul writing in uh, his letter to the Corinthians. He says this to them, very familiar words, I think, to all of us. He says, when he came to them, he came in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my message were not implausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power, so that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of man, but in the power of God. Once the Holy Spirit is at work, he can convict and convert, and we are merely instruments in his great task. What a privilege that is, and what a blessing, the blessing of evangelism. Thank you, Lance. I wonder in uh, closing who God has given us to find. It's a, a great little image, I think. Of course, he's seeking those whom he would, he would save, uh, but he does work through us. That's our privilege as ministers of reconciliation, of fishers of men, to go and find. And what I've found, if I may say, is that Often the people that we're called to find are right under our nose, the, the people that we know that we're rubbing shoulders with regularly. And, and some of my prayer is just open my eyes to the opportunity that I have already and just finding that moment to uh, share Christ in a way that's meaningful. Sing to the Lord and bless his name. Tell of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among all the peoples. We'll go in his peace today. Church, you are loved.